thank you so much. That's very kind of you. But you don't know what I've got to offer you yet. When I was um, a young man, which is many, many years ago, I remember someone once saying about a preacher who walked up the steps of the pulpit full of confidence of what he had to bring to the congregation. It was rubbish. And he fell flat. And he walked down a dejected man. And someone said to him, if you had walked up the way you came down, you would have come down the way you went up. And I think it is a a very humbling experience to bring the word of God to so many lovely people. You're all precious to God. You all can hear God for yourselves. I am taking the next 30 minutes or so of your time I better have something worthwhile to share with you. And can I just say that every time I preach, it is not me alone who's standing up here. Now, of course, we trust that the Holy Spirit is speaking through anybody who's preaching because preaching is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, I always submit my sermons to a whole range of people for whom I'm grateful because I know that they can build what I've got And they can help shape it, and they can say, Andrew, you're just preaching your own ideas there, or it doesn't make sense. So I want to thank a number of people who know who you are in this room, who've helped me to prepare this sermon. Uh, And also, people abroad, I I have great friends back in the UK who I share my sermons with, and ask them to tell me where I'm going wrong, because I'd rather they told me before I stood up than after. So let's pray together that we will hear the word of God as we share together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity, and we thank you that preaching the word is core to your people gathering together. Lord, we have your word, and we pray that you will fill your word afresh with fire and water for us, so that we are fed and motivated by the very words of God. And Lord, I pray that as we share together, as we meditate upon your word, we will be lifted up we will be brought closer to that heavenly vision and we will be changed as a result. Lord, we commit all this to you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So it's my job today to, um, gosh, there are some very small people in this church. No, I've not mentioned any names, Joel. If you wish to um, apply it to yourself, that's your own affair. So we're on a series about uh, heroes in the Bible, and it's my job for the next two weeks to preach about Peter. And Peter um, may or may not be familiar to you. Uh, Let me just tell you a few facts about Peter. First of all, he was the brother of Andrew, one of the 12 disciples that Jesus gathered around himself. Peter was also right there from the very start of Jesus' earthly ministry. So Peter was an eyewitness to all that Jesus did and said. He really understood that. He lived with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He slept beside Jesus. He ate with Jesus. He really understood what was going on in Jesus. He was an uneducated fisherman. That's important because so many of us feel if we haven't got a certain education, if we haven't reached a certain point, then we're of no use to God. That's simply not true. So each and every person, when taken hold of by Jesus, can become a hero. And we're looking at these heroes in the Bible. We need to understand they are people just like us. Okay? We just didn't happen to be living in the time when the Bible was written. But they are just like us. And Peter, almost more than any other, is like us. He was also a little bit confused because he had lots of names. Now, where I come from, I've got one name, and that's it, except when you mistake me for Chris. But I've got one name, which is Andrew. It's how I'm known. But in actual fact, Simon Peter was called Simon in Hebrew. When Jesus first met him, he said, hello, Simon, I'm giving you a different name. I'm calling you Cephas. Cephas, so Simon was Hebrew, Cephas was in a language called Aramaic, and it meant a rock or stone. 
And when you translate that into Greek, it becomes Peter. So Peter is actually his third name in a row. But Peter is the name by which we know him. And rock is what it means. We'll come to that in a little while. So what about the characteristics of Peter? The biggest characteristic is that he bumbled, if you know that word, from one high to another low. And sometimes that high and that low could be separated by only minutes. And here we've got a little picture. Because you may know the story of when Peter actually walked on the water. None of the other disciples walked on the water. But he was so impulsive, he said, let me do it, let me do it. This is what he was like, very impulsive. And I don't know if any of you are impulsive. You rush to do things, and then afterwards you think about it. Okay, Peter was like that. So again, we can, be, we can understand this hero is like us. So that's a Lego model of him trying to walk on the water. Of course, he looks at the water once he's started and panics and starts to sink, but Jesus rescues him. The other picture is how I would walk on the water pretty darn fast because I want to get to that boat before I start sinking. There is actually a sport of running on water, I believe. And in case you're thinking, that is not me. Okay, but I am fast. Okay, so Peter, he bumbled from one high to one low. He was impulsive. He'd speak first and then think later. In other words, he'd open his mouth and he'd put his foot in it. Okay, that was Peter's style. But Peter was always available for Jesus. He was always there every moment of every day. If, Peter, if Jesus wanted a volunteer, Peter was there. What else do we know about Peter? He was also, partly because he was so impulsive and so ready to open his mouth, he was a spokesperson for the disciples. Yeah? So he would be ready to speak up on behalf of what everyone else was thinking. And because he didn't think first, he would say it, and he said some foolish things. Again, anyone else in this room who's been known to say foolish things? Oh, at least Appley. Well, well volunteered Appley. So again, when we look at Peter, we can say, here is a man just like us. He gets it wrong all the time, and yet he's a hero in the Bible. So we know that Jesus can take someone who's, if you pardon the expression, is an idiot, who gets it wrong all the time, who's impulsive, acts rashly, and he can still be used by God for the most amazing things. So if you're in any of those categories right now, listen up, because maybe God wants to use you very powerfully in all sorts of different ways. So whenever someone needed to say something, Peter was there. For instance, when um, Jesus had ascended to heaven and all the disciples were gathered in one place, the Holy Spirit fell in a most remarkable way. No one had ever seen anything like that before. There were people speaking in other tongues. They looked like they were drunk. It was chaos. Everybody thought, what is going on here? These people are crazy. And you know, often God does that. He breaks into our situation and he makes things look incredibly messy because he's doing something new and something powerful. Peter was able to stand up in front of everybody and explain what was happening. And that's another characteristic of God. When he does something remarkable and new, he also explains what's going on. The word comes forth. So it's not just left in chaos, but in actual fact, God explains. He reveals to his people what he's doing. So it may look unexpected. It may look untidy. But the word of God comes into the middle of it and explains what's happening. There was another occasion when Peter was going against the expectations. He would always been working amongst the Jewish people. But suddenly he gets a vision. And he goes off to a house of someone who, <gasps> shock horror, is not a Jew. And suddenly realizes that in actual fact, this message, this wonderful message of salvation, 
is not just for the Jews, but it's for everybody across the face of the earth. And he goes into Cornelius' house, preaches the gospel, and again, the Holy Spirit falls in amazing ways on that household. So again, Peter was prepared to step out of the unexpect, into the unexpected, away from the predictability, and see God move in a magnificent way. Later, Paul picked up that message to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, but it was Peter who initiated it in response to a revelation that he'd had. And this is again where we can be like Peter. God can speak to us in revelation, and we can act on that revelation and see God break into new situations. So already, if I stop at that point, we've got enough on Peter to know that he is truly a hero, but a hero like us, not some superstar who's way up there that we can't relate to. Okay, so I need to read some scriptures, I think. That'd be very important, so I think those should come next. Um, There we go. So we're going to look at this passage in uh, Matthew chapter 16. And they're already well into the ministry of Jesus, the earthly ministry. So this is 16, starting to read at verse uh, 13 in Matthew. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? The Son of Man is code word for Jesus. So people are whispering, here's this amazing teacher doing miracles and all sorts of things, but who is he really? So the the crowd are whispering, and um, the disciples say, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So I don't need to explain that right now, but here's an amazing man doing amazing things, Jesus. And the crowd are saying, God's in this. Who is he? Is he a reincarnation of one of the prophets? But Jesus said to his disciples, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter, remember this guy who's always the first to speak, said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That is amazing. Here is Peter having a revelation that the man standing in front of him is no ordinary man, but this is the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Next slide, please. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Okay, next slide, please. Two things are going on here. The first is Peter gets it very, very right. That's the happy one. The second thing is that Peter gets it very, very wrong. That's the unhappy one. Okay, so what's happened here? Jesus actually says to his disciples, you're ready for a truth now. Who am I? And Simon has this revelation straight from heaven and says, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. That is a phenomenal declaration of faith. And Jesus said, you are right. And there's only one way you know that. It's a direct revelation from heaven. There is no other way 
that we can understand who Jesus is except by a direct revelation of the Holy Spirit at work in our hearts. This is not something you can understand intellectually. You can talk about it, you can reason it, you can argue backwards and forwards, but fundamentally, at the end of the day, you will only understand that Jesus is the Christ because it's supernaturally revealed. It's a revelation that comes at a moment of new birth. So his name is Peter, the rock. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon what rock? It was not Peter. Peter had the revelation. Upon this revelation, I will build my church. The church is not built upon Peter. The church is built upon the revelation that Jesus is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. There is no other way to be part of the church but to grasp that right in your spirit. And Peter had got it. At that moment, a revelation from God had come. And we need to be seeking others get that revelation. In reaching out to see the church built, we don't try just to persuade people. We don't try to show people that it's a good idea. We bring people to that point of revelation that Jesus is the Christ. There is no other name by which we will be saved except by the name of Jesus. And what a vision of the church that Jesus portrayed. Jesus actually, in the gospel, speaks very little about the church. Most of it is about our personal relationship with God and what we do, how we act that out in terms of money, in terms of relationships. But here, Jesus has the most stunning description of what will happen of the church. So he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Brothers and sisters, we need to grasp that amazing revelation too particularly in the times in which we live. Over the last 2,000 years, the world has thrown everything it can at the church. And yet the church has continued to grow and prosper and thrive. Even to this day, where um, governments throw the worst they can at the church, the church just grows faster. None of us want persecution, but it is amazing that when the church is persecuted, it grows phenomenally. We don't know what the future holds for us in this land or any other land. We may have a window of opportunity where we're given favor. There may be a time when that favor is taken away. But the point is, we hold fast to the divine revelation that the gates of hell shall not prevail. And that means not just we stand there and cower while the gates of hell try to hit us. No, it's as the church advances... The gates of hell cannot stand against it, and they are pushed back. It's a very positive thing. And we need to hold on to that. As these days come and we see what happens, we need to understand it's the church that Jesus birthed in that revelation. And we need to understand that the keys, the authority, the keys of heaven and hell, of life and death, have been given to the church that's a corporate thing. We need to do that together and understand when we pray together as the church, that is a powerful thing. That in actual fact, we are changing history as a result of the power that is within the hands of the church that needs to be used together. Not one individual, not one superstar, but the church together made up of every individual, you and me, brothers and sisters, and all the rest of the churches across this land. Together, he's given us, based on that revelation, the keys. But unfortunately, Peter only got it half right. And that's something we need to take from our hero. We are fallible. We only see part of the picture. And again, this is another reason why we need one another. So what happens? Jesus has said, right, you've got that I'm the Christ, but you need to understand something about the Christ. The Christ must suffer and die and be raised again to life. Peter, foot in mouth man, 
very, very sensitively, he takes Jesus to one side. He says, Jesus, I think I need a word with you. And he says, that's not going to happen to you. Stop saying those things. How does Jesus treat Peter? I think if most of us were responded to by someone in the way in which Jesus speaks to Peter, we'd probably march out this building, never darken the door again. (laughs) Jesus actually says to his best friend, who's hanging around with him all the time and doing everything he possibly can, giving up everything for him, he says, get behind me, Satan. If I walked up to Maxley, who gave me a little word of encouragement, I'd say, Satan! What do you think he's going to do? He's not going to be very happy, is he? Yet it's a measure of the man that although Jesus rebuked him, he didn't give up and run away. In fact, it's just as well he could take that because worse was yet to come, and I'll deal with that next week. But you see, when Jesus said to Peter, you are a rock and on this rock I will build my church, Peter ultimately could see it was the revelation, not the man. And when Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, he also knew that Jesus was not rejecting him. It was a temptation of Satan that he was resisting. So Jesus actually was addressing Satan. But in the process, Peter had to realize that he hadn't got it all right And he was being used by Satan to try and tempt Jesus. Okay. So we need to understand we get it wrong sometimes. And God is going to tell us we got it wrong. And it may be through somebody else. How do we react when we make a mistake and we're told we got it wrong? Okay. We need to be ready for that and not walk off in a temper. Uh, Those of you familiar with cricket... You know, you don't walk off and take the bat and ball with you. You know, this is, we're in this game together. And if we get it wrong and make mistakes and, brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but I have done this many times. Even simple little things can get under my skin and make me feel like giving up. I'm a man who says a lot. You might not have noticed that. But I sometimes make contributions to the meeting when it's all going. And usually my contributions mess things up. Yeah? I don't know whether you've noticed that. If I walk to the front, the person leading the meeting usually tries to not catch my eye and pretend I'm not there. Because they know I'm going to do something disruptive. There are times when the leader of the meeting says, no, Andrew, that's not for now. And I have to walk the walk of shame back to my seat. That's just a silly little thing. But you know... If I took that badly, that could mean, I well, I'm never going to do that again. How many times have we been offended by people in the church and then decided, that's it, the church is not for me? But Peter, as our hero, shows us that's not an option. Okay? No matter what rebuke we get, God's rebuke does not mean rejection. And that's very important. We need to know. Okay. So... What we know is that Peter goes through this process. We can look a little bit further in Peter's life and we can see that he's really got it. So one of the things that Peter did was he wrote um, letters to the early church. So we can actually read what Peter says and in particular what Peter says about the church. And I think we should have our next slide, should cover this scripture. So this is a letter written from Peter to the early church. And he says, he's talking about Jesus. um, Verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer, ac- offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then a little bit further down. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once 
you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then he goes on to say, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, or resident exiles is another word that we might, phrase we might use. This is something about how Peter understood the vision of the church. So often we talk about individual salvation. And it's true that each person must come to that revelation of Jesus as the Christ. But what that does is puts us into the church. And the church is not just a vague notion. Oh, yes, I belong to that like I might belong to some club that I just signed up for. No, because we're talking about being built together into a temple. When the New Testament talks about the temple and it talks about the infilling of the Holy Spirit, most of the time, it's not about individuals. It's about a body of people, a corporate thing. So in order to express the presence of God in this world, it is best manifested within the gathered church. So we may be the most brilliant exponents of ministering in the Holy Spirit on our own, but it doesn't find its true place until we are together. And we are living stones being built one upon another. You know what stones are like when you try to put them together. They don't work very well, do they? Unless you've got absolutely flat stones. So edges need to be knocked off. They need to be smooth. They need to be fit together. This one fits neatly next to this one. And so it is in the church to truly express the power the glory and the presence of God, we need to be together physically as the church. Many congregations all over the world, but we have to be together. We cannot neglect that gathering together. This is the vision which Jesus foresaw that through his life, death, and resurrection, through the revelation that came that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God, that all those who called upon his name would be called together and built into this living temple where the glory of God could dwell. So here we are in this land. This is where the authority resides. But we are resident aliens. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, there's one... Th Stop laughing at my photo. It's not nice. My photo or you laughing at me. This is something that every single person in this room should understand. Unless you're an Emirati, everyone should understand this. You are a resident alien. My passport says I am a British citizen. That is my homeland. That is where my citizenship belongs. But I have a residency visa for here. I am entitled to live here. I have moved here and I have made my home here, even though I am British. The Bible says we have a home which is above. In this world, we are resident aliens. We're living here. We're committed to here. We've got a job to do here. It's just not our home. So you are not merely passing through here. You have a home in heaven, but you are called here. And you are called here to commit to and build the church. Because it's where the glory of God resides, dwells, inhabits. So please, brothers and sisters, don't think I may potter along here one day, I may drift along there next day. Put down roots. Jesus, um, sorry. The Lord spoke to the prophet Jeremiah when the people were taken out of the land into exile. And Jeremiah was worried and said, I know it's going to be at least 70 years we're going to be there. How should we be in that 70 years? And the Lord said, buy land, plant vineyards, marry he said, you're going to be there for a while, so get stuck in 
with the civilization that's there, be salt and light in those places. So often, we quote the scripture from Jeremiah, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper and so on. Jeremiah was told that just as he was being led off into exile. This is not a nice little promise box scripture that we can say, say oh, everything will work out fine. This is actually when things don't look brilliant and you're, you're missing home. Actually, what God says to you, get stuck in there. This may not be your ultimate home, but I'm calling you there because you have a job to do. And that job is to build the glorious church. Peter understood that, so he had been through that revelation, and he could write to the church, this is it, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood to declare the glories of him who called you out of darkness and into his glorious light. This is our calling, brothers and sisters. So, um, what does all this mean for us? Okay, it means, I think, first of all, that we must remind ourselves we must begin in revelation. That is where we start. It is a revelation of Jesus as the Christ. Now, I know I'm getting on in my sermon, and that means that Rika and my wife will be ready to fall asleep now. Okay, so I need to do something to wake them all up. Okay, both Rika and my wife have just woken up now and realized I've talked about them. We need to begin in Revelation. So, and as we are praying for others, this is the key prayer that we have for them, that they receive that revelation. I want to challenge you. Do you, and I want you to answer this honestly. This is not just a, oh, Andrew said, put your hands up, so we'll put our hands up. Do you actually have somebody who you are witnessing to, praying for, hoping even, that they will become a Christian? Do you have anybody like that? If you do, can you just put your hand up, please? If you don't, can I just encourage you to be on the lookout? Okay, just take your seats, please, because I'm not quite finished yet. Okay, and can I just encourage you to continue praying for these individuals and to be on the lookout for more people that uh, God may want you to pray for? So that rock of revelation is where we begin for ourselves and for other people. And of course, if there's someone here today who hasn't had that revelation that Jesus is the Christ, then now is the time to sort that and to begin to make a change. And we can pray with you for that. So please do come and make yourself known to us. The second is to grow together. And uh, here we've got, oh my, the musicians have come up. I'm sorry, guys, you're gonna have to wait a little while. Okay. Um, unless that's just a subtle hint for me to get off. Okay, Andrew, you've said enough now. Shuffle off. Um, okay, so here's the thing. These uh, stones are from um, Machu Picchu, which is a place that was built by the Incas, I believe, up in the uh, mountains in Central South America. Um, they had an amazing way of making stones fit together. And it's a great image for us because this, I look across this auditorium and the thing I love so much about this church is we're such a mixed group. Yeah? So it's not one uniform thing that has to fit together. It's actually in our differences, we can still fit together because God has molded us beautifully and we need to work together. So, you know, I look across and you encourage me and I encourage you, I hope, and together we can work with our different skill sets and build a wonderful, wonderful, glorious thing to God. You know, people have been asking me, Andrew, you should be preaching a bit more. Well, okay, but I need you. I can't preach on my own. I mean, Jane's fed up of hearing me. You know, I need, I need an audience to preach to. Um, and similarly, you need me to do my bit. Each of us needs to take up our responsibility in gifting because together that way we manifest the glory of God. So we begin in Revelation. We grow together. And thirdly, we need to endure. We need to keep going because it's so easy halfway through a race to give up. I, um, believe it or not, I used to run marathons. Okay, it's a few years since I've run one now. Um, and that's really because I used to, when I was at school, I played rugby and I was such a 
diddy little thing. I used to get smashed around, and I hated it. And suddenly one day someone said to me, look at you, you're like a whippet. You're just, do you know whippets? They're little dogs. Um, you're like a scrawny little rabbit. You should run. You know, don't, don't bother about trying to fight with people for a ball. Just run, run. And I did, and I found out I could run a long way. But you know, when you're running a marathon, that's, 20, that's 42 kilometers. That's an awful long way to run. It's pretty stupid, really. Um, and sometimes you'd be running along and you'd think, right, I've got to 30 kilometers now. I think I'm fed up with this. Uh, I think I just want to sit down. But you have to keep going because there's a finish line. And nobody gets a prize for running 30 out of the 42 kilometers. I want that T-shirt at the end of it. So um, you've got to keep going. And I know that the church can be a pretty annoying place at times, can't it? Yeah? Maybe those of you looking serious actually no, no, it's a lovely place. I've never had a problem. But can I just say, particularly for those in leadership, it can get very, very disheartening at times when you're trying to do things and people don't do what you're trying to encourage them to do. They don't turn up and, you know, they're grumpy and blah, 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 and you're supposed to keep a cheerful face on it. Sometimes, Building the church can be pretty hard work, okay? And you can lose confidence. But we need to come back to this revelation again, yeah? That actual fact, the church is the chosen way that God has. So I would actually, right now, um, first of all, like to pray for all those who are leading city life groups. Is that what we call them? What are they called? City groups, city life joint, holy, huddle, life, cell, body groups, home groups, that's it. If you are leading, involved in leading any, anyone like that, can you just stand up for a moment, please? At this point, I find they've all left, actually. Um, okay, just, stay, just stand where you are. Wow, what a lot of you there are. Okay, what I want us to do now, if you're near one of these people, can you just turn to them? And if you're a long way, you can even, you're even allowed to get out of your seat and move towards them. Okay, can we now pray for these guys and just pray encouragement and strength into them for the journey which is involved in leading? Okay, can we do that now, please? If, if you're a long way from someone, you might want to get up and move towards them. These are people who generously give their time and their efforts. And let's just pray for them right now. Just pray strength and courage into them and endurance. Heavenly Father, for each and every individual here, Lord, I, who's standing and being prayed for, Lord, I pray that you would, um, you would fill them afresh. Lord, where they've become empty and weary, I pray that you would refresh them right now from the tops of their heads right down to the soles of their feet. Lord, I pray that you would give them strength, that it would not be based on their own human effort, but Lord, you would give them a joy in the work that they do. Lord, I pray that they would have fresh vision for the, the, the church that you are building in this place. Give them wisdom, give them compassion, give them grace, give them kindness. Lord, give them a love that covers over a multitude of sins. And Lord, in their own life where they feel that they're not up to it, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them and tell them, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, bless them, I pray. Let them know your hand upon them. Let them know that they're sheltering under the shadow of your wing. And from this day on, Lord, I pray that you'll give them renewed vigor to build with strength, with courage, to see that living temple grow and be inhabited by your Holy Spirit, that your glory may be seen in all the earth. We pray this in and through the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And now lastly, I just, uh, and this may be some of you the same people, but I just want to pray for anybody who feels that they have been 
received rebuke and rejection from the church in the past. And that's gone deep, and you feel that very keenly. You, you hurt as a result of it. So that most of the time you walk okay, but every so often there's a little limp when something happens. There's a tendency when you hear someone say something, you think, uh-oh, here it comes. I'm going to be hit. And uh, I don't know whether there really is anybody like that here, but that's just what came to me as I was reading that passage. That in actual fact, sometimes we get the hardest knocks from those we love the most dearly. But God wants us to pick ourselves up and carry on, just like Peter did. So if, you, if, if that's you, I'm, I don't even need you to put your hand up, because this is not a question of public shaming or anything like that. But I would like us all to respond to that. Um, so right now, I'm going to pray, and I'd just like us all to close our eyes. And if, first of all, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to bring to our remembrance anything like of that nature where we feel that there's been a rejection or a hurt. Because if the Holy Spirit brings that up, that means it's still sitting there in our hearts somehow. Okay. So Holy Spirit, we thank you that you um, bring us together in part to sort us out and send us out. So Lord, right now, Holy Spirit, I just ask that you will stir up to our remembrance any any painful incident of rejection or rebuke which is still sitting there causing damage and causing us to hurt or walk with a limp or react badly when certain things happen. Holy Spirit, just, just bring that to our remembrance right now if there's anything like that. Okay, now if, you've, if there's something of that nature, I'm going to ask now Jesus to stand in that moment and to be alongside you because any pain and rejection that you feel has already been felt and experienced by Jesus because he was rejected completely. And yet he overcame and his blood enables us to live in the same victory that he does. He is not hampered by past hurts. He is not held back by rejection. And so with that same uh, power that raised Christ from the dead, we're now going to bring that to bear upon those situations when you face rejection and rebuke. Lord, will you come into every heart, Lord, right now? And Lord, would you erase the pain of that memory and that rejection and that conflict? Lord, would you bring healing balm? Lord, pour your precious ointment upon each and every hurt. Remove the root of bitterness, I pray. Take out that splinter, that aggravating uh, root that remains. Lord, bring your wholeness and your healing into each and every heart right now. Lord, it, the scriptures say that a bruised reed you will not break. Lord, you are gentle. Lord, you are humble of heart. Lord, Thank you that your grace covers each and every one of these situations. And Lord, in the place of that, Lord, I pray that you bring healing and that you bring a new strength, a new compassion for others, a new desire to serve you. Lord, a new understanding of how to bring the best out in other people, having experienced it done wrongly before. Lord, let your church grow triumphantly, I pray. Lord, for each and every individual, Lord, I pray today as a result of this example of your hero, Peter, Lord, we would grow stronger, more wise, more able to uh, grow your church into something which so reflects your splendor. Lord, we give you, offer you up everything, all our thoughts during this time, all our hurts, our feelings, our aspirations, Lord, we offer them all up to you and say, Lord, Will you turn them into something wonderful?